Bill Fisher from eMarketer, who is a 15-year veteran of the digital market, uh, primarily as an analyst and a writer, uh, with experience uh, at Gartner and Ovum, uh, uh, and then more recently uh, at eMarketer, which he joined a year ago. Bill. Thank you, Matt. Um, it really is great to be here. Good afternoon. Um, so, we, uh, my, my name is Bill Fish, I work at eMarketer. What we do um, at eMarketer is look at everything that's happening in the world of digital marketing, media, and e-commerce. Uh, we're very much sort of data guys. We look at literally thousands of data sources on a daily basis. We curate that information. We vet it, we synthesize it down into what we consider is the essential intelligence that you need to know. Um, so with that in mind, that's hopefully what I'm going to do today. I'm going to look at some of the key trends that we're seeing in the digital space. Um, some of the guys who are going to follow me are likely going to talk about something slightly more interesting. I'm not going to be able to compete with metaphorical search and racing cars, but I will do my best. Um, and what I'm going to frame my talk on today is this rather cryptic concept of the age of blur. This isn't a bad Britpop pun. Rather, I'm going to look at how um, digital is leading to boundaries blurring with regards to how we need to speak to consumers. So I'm going to look at how uh, consumer behaviours are blurring, indeed how we define a consumer is blurring as well. Um, I'm going to have a look at what that means for, for marketers and in terms of how we, we target them and reach them. And I'm going to look very briefly at the end on the problems that this causes for attribution, uh, which is, you could say, becoming a bit of a blur as well. Before I get into the nitty gritty, I want to start with a true story, and it begins here in the northwest of England. Uh, for those of you that know the area, this is just south of the Lake District, and that brown splodge is an area called the Trough of Boland. To the south of that, there's a small village, and this is where I grew up. A very small place, seven, eight hundred people max. Um, it's very picturesque, and it's a lovely place to visit, but there's not a lot going on there. A uh, bit of a backwater by all accounts. Um, this is the street where I grew up, incidentally, and that's the view from the end of the street. And this is where my story begins. And it actually begins in 1994. Of course, this image is lifted from uh, Google Street View, uh, likely less than a year old. But I can guarantee you that in 94, it looked exactly the same. Uh, and particularly that car park is always empty. There's no reason to go to this village, particularly in the middle of the week. Now this story begins in the summer of 94. I was, show my age here, I was at home revising for my A-levels and this tranquil setting was shattered one day when a fleet of British gas branded vehicles filtered onto the said car park. This was a major event in the village. There was a lot of curtain twitching going on. A number of sales reps filtered from these vehicles and began knocking on people's doors. One rep knocked on, on our door, my mum was in, and, and the guy engaged her in conversation. They were having a nice chat about the weather, about the gossip from the village and so on. Then he got into the business at hand. He asked, does she have central heating? My mum said, yes, we do. It's, it's actually fueled by coal, a coal boiler that we have in the back there. But he saw an opportunity and um, he went on to extol the virtues of gas, the control it would give her and the money savings it would bring. Uh, and, and you've guessed it, at that point she asked him to leave. He failed. I could check to see how vocal an audience we have today. Would anyone like to hazard a guess as to why his sales pitch failed? Anyone? It's a bit left field. I'll, I'll give you a hand. She had to inform him that there's no gas supply to the village at all. <laughs> the, the nearest entry point onto the grid was five miles away uh, in the nearest town. I told you it was a, it was a real backwater, this place I grew up. Um, explains a lot. Five minutes later, the car park was restored to its former glory. 
What I want to illustrate from this story is that 94, we're talking pre-internet, certainly the dawn of the commercial internet as we know it. And, and back then, the marketing proposition was a relatively simple one. Um, it was certainly more straightforward to predict consumer behavior and target them accordingly. But even then, things could still go wrong. Today, of course, the equation is far more complicated than that. The consumer is very much a moving target. So let's have a closer look at this pre-internet and, and post-internet consumer. And this is where we begin to see this idea of blur in action. In terms of how we can reach consumers, apart from the face-to-face -face example, I'm going to look at, at media, because that's what we're about. Um, back then, it, it was relatively simple, three main platforms. I mean, it's not too dissimilar to, to where we're at today in terms of how we communicate with the consumers. Obviously, the internet underpins things and allows uh, different ways of communication. But in terms of the platforms, it wasn't too dissimilar. However, um, uh, the media, I should say, the platforms, however, were very limited in number. More importantly, they were married to the media. So I can safely say that in 1994, I was pretty much exclusively consuming video on the TV set, or if I was lucky enough, I, I got some pocket money and went to the cinema. If we fast forward to where we're at today, obviously, as I mentioned, with the internet underpinning a lot of what's happening, the equation becomes far more complicated. We have a, a, a great many more number of platforms uh, that we can reach consumers with, and importantly now, of course, these platforms are not married to the media. I do not exclusively consume video content on the TV set or at the cinema anymore. I use a myriad number of devices. So the equation is getting more complicated, but it's more complicated than that, of course, because we also need to consider how consumers are getting to that content. Um, again, I don't just sit down in front of a TV screen like I did in 94 and, uh, and, and I'm broadcast at. I time shift some of my view and I stream some of it. I can even store some of it in the cloud. And with mobility on the scene as well, we also need to consider where the consumer is when they're consuming this content. The upshot is we've got a very much more complicated proposition uh, these days. And subsequently, there are, there are more ways that you can fall over. The consumer's a moving target. Uh, and what actually constitutes a consumer is an interesting question as well, because there are some areas of blur here. Pre-internet, the notion of a consumer is very much a singular entity. It was a person or a demographic group. Um, as we saw on the previous slide, there were limited media or platform choices, and they had considerable influence over buying decisions. And, and of course, there's a relatively linear path to purchase. The rise of the web saw that definition essentially split in two. And the way consumers behaved in the online and traditional world was very different. You had to target them accordingly. But if we look at where we're at now, with the amount of device and channel shifting that is going on, these, th th this traditional and online consumer, I mean, it's an inseparable entity now. It's almost like we've come full circle and we need to think again of the consumer as a singular entity again, though of course with all the added complexities that I spoke about in the previous slide. So this expansion and now the contraction, if you will, again, of what constitutes the consumer is due in part to the erosion of some of these established terms like mobile, um, established being a relative term, of course. And if you consider, for example, that a lot of mobile content is consumed in the home environment, then what constitutes um, or, or what makes a mobile device different from any other computing device, it, it's difficult to, to tell. Um, and, and we have some data to, to sort of back this up. Now, just a quick note on the data that we chart. It's very complex, very rich, tells a compelling story. Don't strain your eyes trying to read all these numbers. I'm going to help you with the story and, and pull out the pertinent points. Um, and what we have here is some data from... Uh, Mobidia and Informa, looking at Android smartphone uh, data traffic and how it's carried 
be that over mobile cellular networks or essentially funneled through a fixed network through Wi-Fi, be that private or public. I'm going to take the UK data um, as an illustration because it tells the most compelling and polarised story, but the trend is not too dissimilar across most of the other countries that, that were covered. And that story is that a hell of a lot of, of content, at least on Android smartphone devices, is carried over home or private Wi-Fi networks. Of course, consumers are still very much about mobile, though. And so by the same token, we need to consider how uh, when, oh, sorry, when we consider how consumers are connecting to the online world, that word online takes on a different meaning than it did at the dawn of uh, or the rise of the web. So essentially, well, I'll, what I want to do first is look at some data from my old company, Gartner, and as it happens, they've released new data uh, just recently, but we don't need to look at the, the data in too much detail. Basically, it's just looking at connected device shipments worldwide. Um, and there's a mobile and fixed split. And all we need to take from this is that fixed devices, or those that render us fixed to a location uh, in the home, are very much on a downward trend. Mobile is seeing a, a, a huge uptick. We need to start thinking of online as a persistent state. It's not a distinct characteristic um, of a consumer sitting in front of a desktop or a laptop. And accordingly, that, that term online doesn't really cut it anymore. So we, we're talking about a taxonomy change, and we talk now about digital consumers at eMarketer. Equally, we also need to consider how um, traditional and digital platforms are sharing relevance amongst consumers, not just in the way that consumers are using them, but also in, in terms of the influence that they're having. There's a much greater parity in terms of how consumers are treating these different channels and platforms. So we have some data here from Deloitte. This is a very uh, rich data set. It's looking at the um, type of ads that, that have had an influence on internet users in the, on their purchase decisions. Um, select countries in the US and in Europe. I'm going to take Italy as an example here again because it tells the compelling story, but the trend is similar across the other countries as well. And what we're seeing here is that the, the top two there, TV and online, were cited by 66 and 70% of respondents respectively. Not a lot in it uh, between the traditional and the digital channels there. Um, newspaper, traditional... Uh, receiving a slight, slightly bigger relevance than social, but there's not, there's not too much in it. Online is simply equating to part of this persistent state that I spoke about in the previous slide. And um, we, we speak to people across various industries. And earlier this year, we spoke to Tom Bowman, who is the VP of Global Ad Sales at BBC Worldwide. And we were actually talking to him about the disruptive nature of tablets. Um, but he, he spoke very passionately about some research that they were doing uh, that was showing that consumers are becoming less bothered about the device and they're, they're seeing the internet as the device. And indeed, this has um, this informed their strategy, it's certainly their iPlayer strategy, and it, it channeled them down this route of using responsive design. But this state of persistence was very much on, on Tom's mind as well. And if we look at time spent with, with media, uh, and with digital media in particular, this helps illustrate this idea of, of this persistent state. So this is, um, this is our own data. It's from the US because this sort of data is tracked very well in the US. And it looks at the share of time spent with major media um, in, in the US. And Essentially, what we are seeing here is that digital is getting close to accounting for half of total time spent with, with all the media, 56% accounting for traditional, of course. And for the first time, digital has surpassed TV in the US, or it will do in 2013, which is what we're predicting. What is also interesting to see is that total time spent is rising year on year. So this is re reinforcing this idea that... Um, consumers are devouring content digitally as well as still 
uh, dealing with um, traditional content as well. They aren't fussy about how they get that content, they just want it whenever, however. Um, so we've seen how the lines between online and offline have blurred in terms of how consumers are using media, also in terms of what defines a consumer. But what I want to look at now is how similar forces are, are having an effect in terms of how we advertise to consumers. I'm going to look at branding and direct response. Consumers don't care, of course. An ad is an ad. They don't care about any of this stuff like intent, placement, things like that. But we know, of course, that uh, branding is more important in the offline world. Online, we, we concentrate more on direct response. So let's take a look at branding. Uh, this data from the ANA in the States uh, looks at how US markets are allocating their, um, their budgets. And in the offline space, very much about offline uh, and branding, 60%. But in the digital realm, that drops to 42%. Now, this is actually from quite a small survey base. Illustrates the point well about offline being about branding. But um, I would suggest that uh, in the digital realm, it's still weighted slightly more heavily in favor of direct response. Uh, so let's take a look at another, another uh, data point here. And this, this is our own data for digital ad spend in, in the US. And it, it, it breaks out by industry, but I'm more interested in just by the objective. And if we look at the totals at the bottom there, the amount of uh, digital ad spend allocated to, our, to direct response, close to 60% in 2013, 40% uh, for branding. But these allocations are set to shift. And this idea of blurring boundaries raises its head again. So we uh, forecast out to 2017 for this information. Here is our forecast. And if we look at where we're at now, uh, so this data from 2012, and we look at the split, it's, we're looking at a pretty much 40-60 split uh, in favor of direct response. But by 2017, we're expecting that split to be much closer to 50-50. And, you know, something that is leading to this blurring is the complication of what we consider a branding versus a direct response effort. So I'm going to look at search, and we have some data here from Mail Online. Now, search is way back when was certainly tradi traditionally considered a direct response uh, effort, but given it's the go-to um, resource for consumers on finding information about pretty much anything, uh, search markets have been touting its relevance as a branding, um, of its power as a branding tool. And this data backs that up. So it asked US brand marketers how important certain uh, tactics were for their branding objectives. Video came out top with 26, but search was only 20, uh, one percentage behind with 25%. Now, a lot of what I've been talking about alludes to omni channel efforts. And this concept uh, of omnichannel, we believe, is going to uh, speed up, hasten this breakdown in uh, marketing efforts. So we have some data here from um, the Winterbury Group and the IAB, and it asked uh, US marketing professionals how much value they placed on omnichannel and, and what effect it was having on their uh, various marketing objectives. And, uh, and those objectives were brand marketing, general engagement, and direct response. It was those who attributed a great deal of value to omnichannel on those uh, three, three different areas, was even Stevens. So as you are providing this seamless experience for the seamless consumer, the marketing values, it seems, are, are seamless as well. So with all this blurring of boundaries going on, how the hell do you accurately uh, attribute the steps that have been taken to a purchase, uh, be that digital or online, online one? Well, it's difficult. I don't have the silver bullet. But I can give you a picture of the kinds of problems uh, that this age of blur is throwing up and uh, how marketers have been dealing with it or not. This is... Uh, sort of a no-kidding slide. It tells us something we probably already know, but it's worth saying nonetheless. And Blue Kai asked marketing professionals worldwide if they thought data was important in their segmentation um, efforts. And no kidding, 91% said that it was. 
but it's the type of data that's important in this age of blur. Digital platforms can do a good job of tracking and responding to consumers' online activities. But what we need to think about is joining the dots between offline and online. And that isn't easy either. Um, this data from the CMO Council and SAS asked uh, marketers worldwide how well they were getting on with this integration of online and offline. And the vast majority, 97%, said they weren't, they, they weren't anywhere near cracking it yet. But a not, not insubstantial amount, 46%, said that they were getting better, getting better at it. A further 3% said that one was more integrated than the other, and another 5% said that the other was more integrated than the other. So we know that it's important, right? Well, maybe we don't, because some of us aren't buying into this all that much. Um, some data here from e-consultancy and Lynchpin, which asked a very simple question. It asked companies worldwide, what sort of data are you analyzing? And this idea of analyzing the interaction between on online and offline came pretty low down the list. And, and it was pretty static year on year. Now that's not to say that, that those other data sets that appear above it are not important, because they are. And there are a couple of people who are going to talk, talk to you after me who are going to talk about social, which we can see the second on the list, and why they are very much important. But that's not the emphasis of, of this presentation. What, what I'm emphasizing is this idea of blurring boundaries and changing how we need to interact with, with customers. Um, and this slide pretty much speaks for itself. We are in an age of overlapping activities that are blurring long-standing divisions from advertising to commerce. Marketers have to prepare to be everywhere that consumers are, online or offline, because if they don't, they risk being stuck nowhere. Pretty much like the British gas guys um, were stuck in the trough of Boland um, trying to sell gas. Um, and by the way, there is still no gas supply to the village. And with that, uh, that's me done. Thank you very much.